So today we're going to talk about MongoDB, which is uh, one of the most popular, if not the most popular, NoSQL system in practice uh, today. And so we spoke about three different, four different types of uh, categories of NoSQL systems from uh, those that are the most scalable towards those that uh, exhibit higher levels of complexity. And we've already seen uh, key value stores and column family stores. So today we're gonna to talk about document databases. Um, so in fact, we already saw one, which was Elasticsearch. We, we saw that in a previous class, even before we talked about NoSQL in the context of indexing and searching over text. So this would be considered a document database. Um, and the, the next class next week, we'll speak about graph databases, but today we focus on just document databases. So in terms of uh, document databases, document stores, uh, we spoke about key value stores again, which are typically distributed uh, stores, which are maps. So we have some key, we get some value back. We also spoke about tabular or column family stores, where essentially we have multi-dimensional maps where the values are multi-dimensional. So we have essentially columns or dimensions associated with the values. We still have the notion of keys. In the case of documents, uh, we again have the notion of keys, but we have values that are somehow structured or not necessarily structured. They can also be text, but they're considered to be documents. One thing that's characteristic um, of document stores is that we can also index some of the content of the documents here. So it allows us to somehow uh, choose which fields or which keys we would like to index on. For example, we might index on the continent to allow efficient search on that. So typically they provide some sort of functionality over the documents as well, rather than in the case of a key value store, we could, for example, have a value that's a JSON document or a document similar to this, but it would not provide you any means to, to index or to interact with those documents. So a document store continues considers values that are documents and usually offer some functionality over those documents, be it efficient searches through uh, special indexes or other types of uh, functions or transformations on the documents. <clears throat> so MongoDB. Um, MongoDB essentially is a document store uh, that is based on a JSON-like syntax. syntax. It's effectively JSON with some added elements. Um, so overall, we've referred to this list multiple times. I think it's, you know, although it's not scientific, it's a pretty good indicator, uh, approximate indicator of the popularity of, of database systems. And we see that MongoDB, well, the first four are traditional relational database engines. Um, the fifth is MongoDB. Um, it's similar in, in popularity to, to Postgres. Um, and it's the most popular NoSQL uh, store. So uh, the next one after MongoDB would be Redis. So Redis would be the next popular NoSQL uh, system after, after MongoDB. Um, and then we have Elasticsearch, which we already saw, uh, Cassandra, which we saw in the last lab, um, and so forth. Then the next one is Neo4j, which we'll actually speak about in the, in the next class. So uh, after that, we have Solar, which is very similar to Elasticsearch, in, in, not in terms of syntax, but in terms of purpose. So in any case, MongoDB is, is the most popular, arguably the most popular NoSQL system in use today. So uh, MongoDB, we'll start by talking about the data model of MongoDB. So what we have with MongoDB in general is um, we have documents that are described like JSON. So we have um, some keys or properties and their values. Um, so we have ID, here we have a JSON document describing a series, the wire, uh, name, the wire, TypeScript, and language English. And then we can also have, aside from simple values like numbers and strings, we can also have arrays. So these arrays can be of strings or they can also be of documents, for example. So beyond, um, the aside from arrays, we can also have uh, nested documents as values. So we can assign a, a document that has a, a nested value and has some details nested within it, and we can nest documents in arrays, arrays in documents, and, and nest these in arbitrary ways. 
So this is Jason. I'm sure most of you have probably seen or come across Jason uh, to, to some extent before. Um, what MongoDB adds to JSON is essentially some additional features like we have the notion of IDs, uh, a special type called object IDs, which are used as the IDs of the documents we're going to store. We also have some data types for, for useful um, types of values like dates, for example. So it adds some additional, some additional uh, typed elements, let's say. So sorry, in JSON, in terms of the types, we have strings, doubles, arrays, booleans, objects, um, or documents. And in terms of uh, BSON, this binary JSON format that MongoDB defines, we also have object IDs and dates, and there may also be uh, other, other types added. Um, so, but essentially for our purposes, we're just gonna essentially consider JSON examples. So, what MongoDB does is it maps from, from keys to these binary JSON documents. So we have a key, which is also represented here as the object ID in the document. And the value is just a JSON document. Uh, what is interesting is that MongoDB also allows us to query according to other elements of the document. So we could, for example, find, in this case, TV series whose status is ended, TV series that are, have, have finished. Um, or we could find TV series with a runtime greater than 60 minutes, for example. So we'll, we'll see what sorts of queries we can do and see some concrete examples for that uh, in the class. Um, so there are a couple of key concepts in terms of how the documents are, are collected together um, and um, stored. The first is the notion of a collection, which is um, a collection of similar documents. So for example, all the documents about TV series. In a relational database, this would be kind of like a table, kind of. Uh, I don't want to push the analogy too much, but um, it would be kind of analogous to a table in a relational database. So we have, uh, here we have keys and then we have the, the JSON documents themselves. And we would expect that somehow they would be, there's no strict uh, condition like there is in a relational schema, but we would somehow expect that they're describing the same sort of thing like TV series and that they have similar types of, um, similar types of keys in the document. Um, thereafter, we have the idea of a MongoDB database. And it's, this is a, a, a collection, it's a, um, a set, I guess, a set of related collections. I wanted to say a collection of related collections, but uh, this is sort of analogous, very loosely speaking, to the notion of a schema in a relational database. So here we have a database which refers to TV generally, and then we have within that collections for TV series, TV episodes, TV networks. This would be a sort of a typical use. So this is all in the, the TV database. Um, so any questions or doubts? Okay, so in the class today, I'm going to go through a lot of examples and I will go kind of quickly over them as they're kind of for reference and to give a flavor of, of MongoDB. Um, but if there's any questions, uh, I'm keeping an eye on the chat and you can also shout very loudly and I'll, I'll hear you and stop and you can ask the question. Uh, so any any question or doubt, uh, let me know. But I'll try to pass kind of quickly through the syntax examples, the question, uh, the concrete examples. So the in terms of the the concrete syntax, we can log into a MongoDB shell in a similar way that you would log into a shell for MySQL or for Postgres or whatever it might be. Um, once we're inside that shell, we the very you know, initial things we'll have to do is to load a database um, so or create one if it does not exist and we just use 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 and the name of the database. If it doesn't exist, it will create it. Uh, if we want to see all non-empty databases, we can uh, call show DBS. If we want to see the current database, just type DB. And if we want to drop the current database, we type db.dropdatabase. So this will drop the, the current database. Of course, there's some caution is required uh, for, for this command. Um, in order to create a collection, 
within our database. So we're now in the, what was the name of the database? TVDB, right? So we're in the, the TV database, TVDB. If we want to um, create a collection like series for the database, we call db.create uh, collection series and that will create a collection series of the current database. We want to see all collections, show collections. If we want to drop a particular collection, like series, db.series.drop. It's kind of like a JavaScript-ish uh, notation or similar to many imperative programming languages, I guess, db.series.drop. And if we want to clear all documents from the collection series, db.series.remove, and we can add um, a query here that will match everything. So we'll talk a little bit more about what kinds of queries we can do later. So this will remove all of the documents from the series, clear the, clear the collection series of all documents. Okay, so, oh, 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 sorry. One interesting thing about MongoDB um, is that we can create something called capped collections, which are useful for sort of caching type scenarios where we can uh, cap a collection in two ways. We can cap it in terms of the overall size. I believe this is uh, in terms of bytes. Um, I would have to double check that, but I believe this is the, the number of bytes. Um, or we can cap it in terms of the number of documents it contains. So in this case, we're capping in terms of both. So either this, it can't exceed this size, nor can it exceed this uh, number of documents. If it does, then the oldest um, document will be removed to make sure that, um, that the, the collection is kept within the specified size. So this could be something like, you know, keeping in a collection the last 100 episodes that were queried or the last 100 episodes that uh, have been released for, for uh, a series or, or whatever it might be. So a sort of a, um, uh, a cache, caching type system, let's say. Okay. Um, so next we have inserts into the documents. So the first option is to insert a document without an ID. So we can just insert something that looks like a regular JSON document. We can call db, which is the current database, dot series, the name of the collection we want to insert the document into, dot insert, and then pass it a regular JSON document. So this will then cause the, um, cause the document to be inserted. And we see here this return result, which tells us that one document was inserted. Effectively, this is the result that uh, that MongoDB will return us. If we want to insert with an ID, we can. We can use the Bison uh, syntax here to specify that this should be considered as an object ID. And we can specify the, the specific ID we want to index for this document. This will fail if the ID already exists. So we'll return an error that this ID already exists in the collection. Um, we can use update or save to update an existing document if we wish. This would be, you know, or we could remove the document and then insert it again. Um, but we can't insert a document with an ID that already exists. So if we wanted to, um, we can use save an uh, ID to overwrite. So for example, we can um, use save rather than insert to overwrite uh, the document that was uh, provided here with this new document, which will essentially just contain a name. So we'll get rid of the old document that was inserted here, and we'll save this new document with the same ID, but with some new, new data. Uh, so in this case, we see that one document was matched to be overwritten, and one was modified. That's the one we, we had written over. OK, so this overwrites the old document. Um, so in general, MongoDB is kind of maybe a kind of a challenging, um, challenging topic to teach because it doesn't have um, the, the way it's defined and all the documentation is geared towards developers who want to jump in and start using it quickly and they'll find it quite intuitive because it looks like an imperative syntax, db.series.drop a JSON document, right? So it's very geared towards being kind of developer friendly. 
but it lacks um, an overall structure. Sometimes the documentation is largely based on examples. You have to kind of induce from the examples what, what it actually means, what the operations are doing. Um, and there's nothing like, uh, you know, something like in SQL, you have this relational algebra, which if you understand it, then it sort of explains more or less everything. And, and then you have, okay, all these different ways of expressing those queries in SQL. Um, but here I will try to talk about MongoDB in a more structured way using a sort of relational algebra style um, um, analogy. So the, the first thing would be that we can do queries and we can do queries with selection. So what do I mean by selection? This is selection in the relational algebra or similar to what you would put in a WHERE query in a, a, a WHERE clause of an SQL query. So we'll start with queries with selection. Um, first thing we do, the, so the general, the general kind of function for querying is, is called find. So we do find on a, on a collection. So we'll query doc documents in a collection with find in general. So we're querying the documents in the, series, in the collection series. If we specify nothing, essentially it will just return all of the documents in the collection as a result. Um, so, okay, that's kind of interesting. If we just want to get like a document to see what kinds of documents are in a collection, we can use find one to return one document, which I presume will probably be the first document in the collection, but um, it will just return you some document in the collection, let's say. Um, if we want to uh, get some nice looking, more human readable results, we can use the function and we can use this on, we can append this to any other thing we might want to do that returns JSON. But we can um, we can call the pretty the the pretty the pretty uh, uh, function uh, on the result. So um, this will give us a properly indented JSON document that looks like this. Um, so essentially, we can read it. It looks much nicer than what we saw before, which is without all the new lines and indentations. So it takes maybe a few more bytes, but uh, much easier to read. So pretty helps us to, to do that. Um, okay, so we've seen how to just, you know, get a document, get all the documents. We can also specify and find the selection criteria. Okay, so we can specify, for example, equality that essentially the, the documents that we're looking for must match this equality condition. For example, find all the documents that have type equal to scripted. So this will return in this case, the document that we expect because it matches here, this part of the document matches the, the condition, a type is scripted, type is scripted, we return the document. Um, so just to note that the results would generally here include the ID, but I'm just gonna remove it from the examples because it's not so important it's just to be a little bit cleaner and more concise. So I won't give the IDs, the document IDs here. Uh, but they would be in practice returned. Um, okay, so the next is a nested key where we can, uh, here for example, we're doing rating.average as the key, which is interpreted as a sort of a, a sequence of, of keys. So what we're doing here is we're referring to average within the rating um, key. So we see here that we have this uh, nested object or document so what we're doing is we're, we're referring to uh, average inside rating. Okay, so rating.average, rating average, 9.4, and then we do equality. We see that it matches, and therefore we return the document. So we can use this dot to somehow uh, look at nested values in a, in a quick way uh, and to provide equality or other conditions on those. Okay. Um, Nulls are always tricky in any query language uh, or also programming languages. Nulls can be, um, you know, uh, the, the, a source of counterintuitive examples. So to clear up what happens with the nulls, we can have nulls in, in MongoDB. We can say, for example, that the average of the ratings is null, maybe because there's no ratings uh, thus far defined. So if we, we can also use nulls in the queries, if we use a null in a query, what it will do is um, it will return the document if the value is null 
or if there is no such value for, if there is no such appearance of average in the document that we're referring to. So it matches when the value is null explicitly, or in this case where we have no average within rating, it will also return the document because it will also return this uh, equality here will also match when the field doesn't exist with that key. So we don't have any average here that matches this condition here. So we can do equality on nulls. Um, equalities on documents. Okay, so how would this work exactly? So we can also, you know, provide the full syntax where we can do a full match on a document. So we can say that the rating, the, va the value of rating must be exactly this, yeah, which is similar to equality. So in this case, we see that this is exactly the document that's specified here. So we return that document as a match for the query. Okay, so it matches because the document matches the query here and the, the document here. What about if the, um, what about if we have this sort of scenario where we have rating votes uh, 9001 and here we have rating average 9.4 votes 9001. Um, so this is sort of like a partial match of the document here. So what happens in this case? Well, there are no results. So MongoDB defines that really this is this has to be an exact match. It has to match the, the full object somehow. What about the case where we swap the order and we have votes first and average next? Would this match um, this document here? Well, this is a question of whether JSON is a is a you know is it ordered? The elements are ordered, which is the case in XML, which is kind of a similar tree-based syntax. In XML, things are, are ordered. In JSON, there's no such a, there's not such a strict specification of JSON. I'm not sure if this is defined anywhere, but in this case, uh, MongoDB assumes that the ordering matters. Yeah. So the order of ad attributes matter, which means that because these are out of order, we get no results. So to be able to match a document, we really need an exact match in terms of um, being a complete match um, and being having the, the keys in the same order. OK. Um, so one thing to mention is probably, sorry, when I talk about keys here, I'm talking about sometimes I'll say properties or keys or uh, uh, fields maybe sometimes as well. But uh, keys are not like the key values. The, uh, the IDs of the documents would serve as the keys. It's just kind of confusing because there's, there's different terminology for these different things. But um, keys here would be the key of the, of the field. Um, so in terms of the equality uh, of a race, here we have an example where we have a, an exact array that we want to match. And we see we have an exact match here. So we return the, the document. In other words, we can return, um, we can do equality on exact arrays. Much like before, if it's not, if it only is a partial match, we get no results. Or if it uh, has all of the elements, but in a different order, we get no results. The order of elements in an array matters as well. So we also have the ability to find elements within an array. So if we write this, uh, what this would typically mean is uh, genre uh, is equal to thriller. But it has this second meaning that if genre has uh, an array, which is um, an array of values, then it's also OK if thriller appears within the array. So um, this means that somehow it has this both, it's sort of like e equality in case that the value is directly given or it, is, it appears in the array if it's given as an array. Okay. So in this case, uh, in fact, it matches. We see that the thriller value is in the genre array. So it, it matches. And the syntax is exactly the same as value equality, um, which I is a bit risky in my opinion. <laughs> so we're kind of using the same syntax for two different things now, uh, which is kind of maybe, it, you know, it looks intuitive in this case, but you know, what's gonna happen further down the road? Um, 
when we look at more complex examples. But anyways, so um, here we have two, two inserts. So just to clarify this point of the dual meaning. So we have an insert of a document with name A and value five, six, and a document with B value five. So equality here, where we say value five will match a value directly and will also match some value inside an array if the value is an array. So in this case, we'll get both documents being returned, although they match for different reasons. Uh, so yeah, I guess this could be intu considered intuitive, but uh, I think it's sort of a, a concerning thing to do because when we start looking at more complex examples, this can quickly get, uh, you know, complex in terms of are we referring to the array itself or something inside the array and we'll see an example of, of where that confusion arises later um, okay so uh, we can also aside from saying equals or contains or something is exactly equal to this thing we can also do inequalities less than greater than less than or equal greater than or equal not equals so lt for less than greater than and so forth any for not equals um, so we rather use a sort of adjacent style syntax rather than using you know your typical expressions of the greater than symbol or the less than or not equal symbol so to find something less than, for example, we can find all runtimes, uh, all series with a runtime of less than 17 minutes uh, per episode. So we use runtime, the less than key, and 70. And we'll find, for example, this document will match because 60 is less than 70. So we can also, um, we saw the way where we can use the sort of equality condition to match one value within an array. So it will also match if it's equals to some value in, in an array. And we can use match any value uh, with the in expression, okay, which allows us to also specify that it can be one of several. So some element in the array must be uh, one of these, okay. Or we can uh, say matches no value. So we can say that no element of the array matches any of, of the uh, elements specified here. So this also passes if the key does not exist, which um, I think is a, maybe a little bit weird, but anyways, this is, this is what MongoDB defines. So um, in terms of matching any value, uh, here we have runtime in 30 or 60. So it suffices if the value matches any uh, value within this list. Okay, so I think this is pretty intuitive. Uh, so it matches because 60 is in the list, 60 here, and we're, we're good to go. Um, in case of a, an array where we have science fiction and thriller here, if we say genre in noir or thriller, what we have is one match of one of the elements, one of the, you know, the intersection of the query array and the document array is not empty. There's, they have something in common. So therefore it matches and we return the, uh, the document as a result. So if the key references an array, any value of the array should match any value of them. So somehow that the intersection of this array here and this array here, if it's not empty, then it matches. Um, so aside from the kind of base conditions, as you know, one might expect, uh, for example, in languages like SQL, uh, we can also combine different selection criteria by using and, or, not, or nor. So for, um, for um, allowing um, com Boolean combinations of, of conditions. So naturally, we can also nest such conditions. So we can have an and of or uh, and so forth. So in terms of and, um, how would this work? A simple example, we have an and condition here with two different selection criteria. In the first, we're saying that the runtime must be either 30 or 60. And we're saying that the name cannot be lost, not equals lost. So runtime is 30 or 60 and its name is not lost. So we see runtime is 30 or 60 matches that and the name is not lost. It seems to match the condition. So we return the document. Um, so just to give one example of a Boolean combination. 
we also have some existential conditions which allow us to check if things exist or not. Um, so this is using the keyword exists with true or with false. So this allows us to check if something exists or does not exist. So if an attribute exists, we can uh, check this by using name exists true. Um, and this is slightly different to null, uh, to, for, to the query name null for a reason that we'll speak about in a second. So essentially, in this case, we see that um, okay, I'm using another term now, which is attribute. <laughs> um, the, the key name are, okay, so the, let me uh, be more consistent and call these attributes to avoid uh, because there's keys and there's uh, all sorts of names. So we'll call these attributes from now on so that the attribute name exists. Um, so what this means is essentially, it just checks to make sure this attribute exists in the document and if so, it matches. So the difference with a uh, name null is that even if the value is null, if we had name null here, it would still match, right? Uh, or sorry, it would, yeah, it would still match here. Yeah? So if we use not exist, then it would not match if, if we had the value null. So this is somehow distinguishing it with uh, equality and all. So the attribute does not exist. This is the next uh, part. So if we have uh, black mirror and we have uh, name exists false, checks that the key doesn't exist. And in this case, we have we see that it does exist, so we get empty results. Okay. Um, we also have some more advanced selection conditions for arrays which allows us to apply different types of matches on the elements of, of arrays. Um, so the first is all, and all says essentially that uh, the array must contain at least all of the elements contained here. Not just one, not just have a non-empty intersection, but it must contain all of these uh, values. So somehow the array must be, if you converted it to a set, it must be a subset of, um, or a superset, sorry, the document must contain all of the values specified in the array of the query. So we see that comedy is contained in here and sci-fi is contained in here. So we see that we have a match and we, we return this result um, as expected. So all of the values are in the array. So it's uh, considered a match. So on the other hand, uh, we can do um, uh, provide a list of selection criteria. And then we can say that uh, we want to match an element. We want to find an element that matches all of the selection criteria we have mentioned. So in this case, what we're looking for is that in series, we must have some element that matches all of these conditions. So it matches, it's greater than one and it's less than three. So the only uh, element that matches this is two one element in the array is sufficient to, to match the document. Okay. So one element in the array matches all of the criteria. So it's sort of like you combine all of these with and, it would be equivalent. And we can um, finally, in terms of arrays, uh, find arrays with an exact size. For example, we can find um, size uh, equals three, for example. We see that this array here has length three, which means that it will match the, the query and be returned as a result. So um, just to mention that this is only possible for an exact size of array. So we can't specify ranges. We can't say a length of uh, an array greater than four, for example. What we could do maybe is if the range is finite, is define it with or size is three or size four or size five, but um, yeah, not possible for, for uh, our arrays of, of different ranges. Um, we can also do selections on the types of values. So we can specify that we're looking for things that have certain types. So they, these can be timestamps, double strings, decimals, uh, binary data, ints, longs, booleans, arrays, object IDs. So there's a variety of things here that um, you know would be more or less uh, familiar in certain types as well that are specific to well specific to um, to MongoDB. So we can specify different different types or select uh, documents based on having a certain type of value given attribute. So 
In terms of the types of values, uh, for example, we can find all the documents whose runtime is a number. Okay, so here we see that runtime is a number, so it matches, so we return that result. And we can also, for example, find all the documents whose uh, genres are of type array, right? So we see here that genre is of type array, it has an array value, so therefore, okay, matches, right? Well, not quite. Uh, this returns empty results. So intuitively, what this seems to query for is, well, documents whose genres are given as arrays, and this is a genre, and this is an array, but this is part of the problem of what I mentioned before of the double definition of, of, of reference. So it can reference something, the, the object, or it can reference something inside the object. And here, what we're thinking is that this should reference the object. The object is an array. But what it's actually doing now is it's referencing inside the array. So it's saying that these things here have to be arrays. And this is sort of, you know, something that's not, it's, this is how it's defined in MongoDB, but it's an ambiguity that's created by certain decisions that were, were taken earlier on. Um, so it passes if any value in the array has that type. Okay. So this is this returns not empty. Re, uh, this returns empty results, even though it, it looks really counterintuitive because of this design choice that was made earlier. <clears throat> So here's the definition that describes why that happens. So it matches elements inside the array, not the array itself. And so one might ask, what if I want to check if the value is an array? Uh, this would be a pretty typical type of query. So what you would have to do, given a document like this that has been inserted, you would have to use genre and then do an element match. So any element within the array matches the condition that it exists true. So it's essentially like true. It's like a, a trivial condition. So essentially any element, any array with an element will be satisfied by this and this will find all of the genres with an array value. Um, so you might then ask, uh, what if the array is empty? Well, if the array is empty, the last one doesn't work. So you would have to do an or, uh, or some element matches the trivial condition or the do an exact match on the empty array. And this would then find you all of the documents that have an array for the value or for the attribute genre, which is not intuitive at all. Um, okay, so uh, we have maybe one more minute. Um, so we have also some other operators like modulus, we have regular expression, we have text search, so we will talk a little bit more about how to index stuff for text search. We can also specify custom um, selection criteria using JavaScript code, but this is definitely something that, that is best avoided because really how it will process it is to go over every document, run the JavaScript code of the document and return a true or false value. So there's no way to optimize this with indexing or, you know, even in the case of certain uh, conditions, in any case, this would have to be done to read all the documents, but still where is best avoided if you can express it in terms of uh, other features of, of MongoDB. So, but you, you do have this option of writing some custom JavaScript um, for your selection criteria. So there's also other geographic features that I won't get into, um, but you can do you know, certain geographic types of selections as well. Uh, if you have geographic data, you also have some bitwise features for, for dealing with you know, binary data, um, which I won't get into in detail. And that's the selection. So that's sort of like the where clause of, uh, of MongoDB that allows you to, to specify the conditions on what documents you, you want to match um, so we'll take uh, a break. I didn't hear any questions. I, I hope you're following along. Is it okay? And yeah, it's not too fast. I feel it's kind of, you know, there's nothing really new here. It's just translating the syntax um, of MongoDB a little bit. Yeah, Rufo, uh, I imagine we will see this later. But what, what can we can we do if we want to store a blob, like a PDF, for example, in other words? 
Um, so you, you can do that. You could represent it and embed it into your into your um, into your JSON document as some binary data. But you and there, I think there are there is a data type for that. There is a data type for dealing with you know uh, with like bits essentially. But you probably wouldn't want to. You're not going to be defining any sort of um, any sort of uh, query functions on it. So it's not. It doesn't really serve you to store it within MongoDB. What you could possibly do is is contain is give a pointer to it. Like you could uh, store it elsewhere in HDFS or in your file system or online, and rather store a URL or a locator and an address for that. Because storing it in MongoDB would probably kind of uh, clog up MongoDB a bit if you had lots of PDF documents. And uh, you're, it's not going to buy you anything versus just storing it on a file system and um, and referencing it, its location there. Great. Thank you. And that time is wrong. Uh, break until until sorry. Um, let's say fifteen. I got the time wrong. Sorry. It would be fifteen twenty. No, but fifteen. Let's say fifteen twenty. Uh, three. Since, um, sorry. Any other questions or or doubts? Okay. Um, so we'll see you in, in ten minutes. So we'll say until fifteen twenty three. Um, I was adding five minutes instead. I'll post the uh, post activa in uh, a minute. Okay. So following the, the relational algebra analogy, the next thing we have to decide is what we want to project from the document. So thus far, we've matched the document and then afterwards returned the whole document or not returned it at all if it didn't match. Uh, similar to projection uh, in the relational algebra, we can select certain attributes that we want to return from the document rather than return the full document. So maybe we're not interested in the full document in the results, but rather some, some uh, output uh, fields or attributes. So we have two options for, for projection. Um, we can either choose what we want to return, where we would use one, or we would um, choose to suppress fields, what we don't want to return. Um, with that, in that case, we'll use values of zero. So this allows us to either select the, the, the attributes we want with one or select the attributes we don't want, returning everything else with zero. So we also have some uh, options for projecting from arrays. Maybe we don't want all the values of the array. So we have this sort of slightly complex feature using dollar sign, uh, which allows us to, um, to return the first matching uh, array element, which we'll have to see an example of. We have a similar feature, which allows us to uh, only return elements of an array that match certain conditions. And we have slice, which allows us to output the first or last uh, elements of, of an array, first or last n and k elements of an array, let's say. So let's jump into some, some examples of these features. So we have uh, projection, positive projection, let's call it where we can output certain fields. So we have a query here. This is our selection criteria, which tells us which documents we match. Then we select what we return from the documents that we match, where we say we want net name, runtime, and network to be returned. 
So we see that in this case, the document matches the query because the runtime is greater than 30. And we'll return the name, the runtime, and the network. In this case, we don't have a network, but that's no problem. We just don't return it, right? If we had it, we would. Uh, but if we don't, we won't. So we get back the, the results here. I'm showing the ID because it's actually kind of important for projection. So we're going to include the ID here, um, as we'll see in a second. So this allows us to, to choose what we want to return. And by default, it will also give us the uh, DID of the document. Okay. We can also decide if we want to uh, use this sort of syntax for referencing embedded elements to return um, fields, attributes that are within nested documents. So in this case, um, we will return the document with the name as specified and the ID returned by default, and also a nested document that just contains the average. So we don't return, in this case, the votes, just the average. So we can also project uh, embedded fields. So the field is still nested in the output. Right? So we have rating and then a nested uh, document or object with average uh, 9.4. The next uh, thing would be to um, here to look at what happens if we have an array of documents. So here we have reviews.score. Okay, so here we're sort of intuitively referencing the scores within uh, the array of, of objects or documents that we have here. So in this case, um, what we're returning is just we're still maintaining the same structure, but we're just keeping the score elements of these documents. So we're dropping the user. So this also works. So we keep reviews is still an array of uh, objects and each object just has the score now. So we can use this as a shortcut to project these sorts of uh, fields. So it will project from within the array, the, the nested values. So we can also use projection to suppress certain fields to remove them from the output. So this is sort of like return everything but these attributes. So in this case, we say, OK, we query for, again, series whose runtime is greater than 30. So we have a match here. And then we say series 0, which means don't return the series. So this will return all of the other elements, including, again, the ID. So we get the name and the runtime and so forth. Um, so in general, we cannot combine 0 and 1. So we can combine the negative and positive projection, uh, except for in one particular case. Um, which is in the case of suppressing IDs. So what we can do is say, return the name and the series, but please, uh, in this case, suppress the ID, which would otherwise be returned by default. This is the only time where we can combine zero and one. Otherwise it wouldn't be really, it would be kind of unclear what to return. So in this case, we return the document, which matches the query again, and we return all of the data except for, or sorry, we return the name and the series, but we disable the ID and the results. This is the only case where you can combine zeros and ones in the projection to get rid of the default ID. So zero uh, suppresses the ID when the other fields are output. Um, with respect to projecting from a race, what we can do is, okay, this is a slightly tricky um, uh, feature, but we can use a dollar sign to return the first element that matches the selection criteria. It's a bit tricky because it's mixing or somehow referencing the selection criteria here in the projection criteria here. So what the query says is the selection criteria match documents that has a series that is an array where each uh, where at least one element is greater than one. In this case, in the document that we've indexed, we see that a series has two elements that satisfy this condition. So two and three are both greater than one. What this says then is that we want to return only the first element of the array that matches the selection uh, condition here. Okay, So it's essentially return the first element in the array that's greater than one. In this case, it would be two. So what we do, we get as results, we get the ID and we get the series uh, with just the array containing two, the first element matching the selection criteria. Okay, so it's like a shortcut for not having to repeat the selection in the projection. Um, 
we have another option, which is to specify a different condition for the elements that we, we want to, the first element we want to match. So in this case, we're searching for a series that have um, an element greater than one. So this document is matched, but now rather than return the first element matching the selection criteria here, we will return um, the first element matching this different condition, which is that it's less than three. So what do you think this would return? Any, any ideas? So we know that it will return an element with one value. Um, do you think it will return an array with one, an array with two, or an array with three? So it will return uh, one of those options. I can't see the chat, unfortunately. Yeah. It depends on the comparison order, right? So it depends on how how things are. Oh, I can't I can't show chat. Um, it depends on the order in which the elements are are conducted. What happens here is actually they're independent. So the selection criteria will first match the documents. Okay, so it will say what documents are relevant, and thereafter, when we have the relevant documents. We, aside from this last thing we saw, aside from this case, which is a special case, after we've selected which documents we want using the selection criteria, the projection criteria, except for in this case, the, the projection criteria is completely independent, right? So we take this document, we match this document, and then we say, okay, now project the first element matching this condition. And that element is one. Even though one doesn't match the condition here, it matches the document is matched. And then taking that document, the first element of the array that matches the condition less than three is one. So we will return an array with one, which is maybe a bit confusing. Some people would say two, right? Because it's the first element somehow that matches both conditions. But in this case, it's the first element that matches the, the projection uh, condition that we're going to return. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So this is sort of allows to separate the selection projection criteria for what's returned from an array. Um, okay, in this case, if we have, for example, uh, a condition that's not matched by any element of the array, uh, essentially it will just drop the, it won't return anything for series. So it will drop the array field entirely if no element is projected rather than just returning an empty array or something like that. So we see that no element of the array matches is greater than three. So we drop the entire series field um, from the from the result. Um, okay, so in this case, we have uh, a condition greater than one for series, which is matched. So this document we, we will match. And then we say from the reviews, return the first element that matches this condition, which is that the score is greater than eight. And we see that in this case, reviews actually contains an array of documents. So we'll return the first element that uh, has a score greater than eight, which is actually the first document here. So the format of the output will contain the entire, uh, the entire document, right? Because we're not doing a nested reference, we're specifying return the first element of an array and the first element is the entire document that satisfies a condition and it satisfies the condition, so. This is the result we, we, we get as a, as, a, as a response to the query. So I have a question. Sure. What would be the output if the condition would ask for 8.5, for example? Um, so if it were 8.5, greater than 8.5, it would return, it would look through the uh, array, which is an ordered uh, list of elements and it would return the first that has a score greater than 8.5. So in this case, it would return precisely the same, the same result. Uh, if oh, it, sorry, but yeah, yeah. If or it is less or equal. Yeah, less, okay. So if it were less or equal, uh, that would be LTE 8.5, then it would skip the first one because it doesn't match and it would return the first element that matches, which is now the second element. And here we would have user Jill score 8.3. And that being the first element of the array that matches the condition. 
Um, if it were less than eight, so that none of the elements match, uh, of the array match, then we would entirely drop the reviews and the array part. So reviews would not appear in the result for that particular document. Okay, thank you. Yep, okay. Um, so the last uh, projection feature that we have uh, for a race specifically is to return the first n elements or to return the first or last n elements using slice. So we can use slice n, which will return the first two elements of an array. Uh, here we see what it looks like. So we'll return all of the all of the attributes, all of the all of the fields, and we will return for the the series array just the first two elements, slice two. So we slice off the third element. Um, we can also return the last elements by using a negative value for n. So we can say slice minus two, which will take the last two elements uh, of the array. So in this case, we'll have series two and three slicing off the first element one. Um, so we need to specify a negative number if we want to take the last elements or a positive number if we want to take the first elements. If we want to do an offset and a limit, like a skip and return, we can get, provide two values. So we can say skip first two values here and then return one. So this is skipping one, two, and then returning one value, which would be three. So this would return as the array with just three in it. Uh, we can also combine this with um, skipping from the skipping from the uh, n and then returning n. Okay. So in this case, we can. Uh, uh, rather start from the n and then uh, return n. So here we have minus two, which suggests we skip one, two, and then we read one in the forward direction. So we would expect this to return an array with two. Okay. Um, you can also, it's kind of weird not to include the last case, but you can also return, I'm almost sure anyways, I'm not sure why I didn't include it, but this could also be negative. So if this were minus two, minus one, then you could skip two and then return the last one in this direction here, which would be one. I'm almost sure that's possible. Um, so yeah, so we can kind of start from the start or start from the end and work backwards or work forwards, uh, skipping some elements and then returning the next uh, n elements. Okay, any questions or thoughts? Yeah, I you do start stop. Uh, start stop some step. kind of yeah. In step, I don't think so. So I'm not familiar with that syntax. I don't know. I haven't. I barely program in Python. Um, but you can. You can't do steps, so you can't say every second element, for example. As far as I'm aware, at least I, I don't think that's possible. So you oh, can fine. just you can just start from either start or the end and skip some and then start reading. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Um, so with respect to updates, um, we have um, updates to modify fields. So thus far, all we've seen is sort of queries and what to return. We can also modify documents, uh, modify the, the fields in the documents. So we can set a particular value. We can unset something to remove an attribute and its value. Uh, we can rename something, which will change the attribute of the, the field. We can um, do a set on an insert. So this is essentially the idea that if we do an operation where um, the operation results in the document being created, then we can set a certain value uh, on a certain field for that. Uh, we can increment numbers by a certain amount, multiply numbers uh, by a certain amount, uh, replace values less than min by min, max, and so forth. So we have various features to, to process and to modify fields and documents. Um, we can also set something to a current date, which is useful if we have something like a last modified field, for example, in our document that we'd like to keep up to date. So we'll see some examples. Um, so updates in general combine query or selection criteria and update commands, update uh, actions. 
So here's update. So we have db.collection.update and we pass a query, first of all, which are the, we're gonna select all the documents using selection criteria that we want to update. In this case, we want to potentially update all documents of type scripted. And what we want to do is set, in this case, the type to fiction. So it's essentially, you know, replacing type scripted with type fiction in all of the uh, collection. We have to specify multi-true to tell MongoDB that we want to do this for multiple documents, not just the first document in the collection. So um, this is our update and this will give us uh, an idea of how many elements were matched, uh, how many documents were matched and how many documents were modified as a result of the update. Um, so then if we do a query and we get back our document, we'll see that scripted has now been replaced by fiction according to our update here. So this is the general form of, of update that we, we use. So we can also use updates to modify arrays and documents. So for example, to add something to a set if it doesn't already exist, add something to an array if it doesn't already exist, to delete a first value or a last value from an array, to append items to an array with push, to append multiple items, or sorry, to remove uh, multiple values from an array, or to remove only those values that match a certain condition. So there are certain sub operators that we can use upon pushing or adding values to post process after pushing the values, post process the array. So we can select the first element matching a certain query condition. We can add or push multiple values. We can apply a slice. So we can add some elements and then just keep K values afterwards. We can sort the array after adding new values. Uh, or we can um, also decide to push uh, values to a specific array index. So, uh, sorry, I said something incorrect. This is not always applied. These are not applied after uh, pushing or adding values. Things like sort will be applied after pushing or adding values. Some of these are actually conditions that specify how the new elements should be sorted. So sort and slice would be applied afterwards. Um, position uh, actually specifies where the values will be added. So some are kind of part of the arguments of, of where to add the elements and others are applied afterwards. So if we want to modify arrays and documents, um, let's have a look at some examples. Uh, here we have um, an array for types. So we have scripted and we have drama and we have an array for languages, which is English and Spanish. So the first thing that we're going to say is pull which will remove elements from an array that match a certain condition. So from the arrays for type, it will remove any elements in drama or sci-fi from those arrays. And then from languages, it will remove any element that's Spanish. So it will remove Spanish from the languages and either drama, drama and uh, sci-fi it will remove from the type arrays. So in terms of um, what result we get if we query this document after running this update, what we'll see is that we've removed drama and we've removed Spanish from the languages. And so this allows us to remove elements in a pretty flexible way from, from in a pretty flexible way from arrays. Okay. Um, if we want to rather um, change certain values, we can again use this sort of slightly strange dollar sign symbol that we saw before, which is sort of the first element that is matched by the, the selection criteria here. So this is essentially saying that we're looking for ratings that are greater than 10. And we see that there's an array of values here. So the first element that matches this condition is 11. So we're gonna say set the ratings, the first element that matches this condition, set it to 10. So what this says is the first element of the array that's greater than 10, set it to 10. And if we look at the result of this, what we'll see is that we get back um, the document and we'll have eight, and now 11 has been replaced by 10, 13, nine, and so forth. So this allows us to somehow do some action on the first element matching the selection uh, criteria here. So it's kind of like a shortcut to avoid having to re, you know, copy the selection criteria into the update. Um, as a next example, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to push some additional values and then post process them. So to push them, what we're going to do is push into ratings, which means add to the ratings array. We're going to add 
four and nine, these two values. So we're going to have six values in total. And then we're going to specify that um, the array should be sorted in ascending order. So from low to high, and then take the first four elements. So if we put all of these operations together, we add four and nine here, and then we order them ascending and then slice, uh, take the first four elements. We would expect to have four, eight, nine, nine in our array. And if we query our document, uh, we'll see that we get 4899 as expected. So we can add some elements and then specify either arguments about how those elements should be added or some post-processing to apply it to the array after adding them. Um, so sort and, and slice. Again, this feels maybe a little bit weird. It feels like it's combining two different things, which is uh, a little bit strange maybe, but anyways, this is how MongoDB defines this. Um, so this is essentially all of the updates we can do. So we can you know, change values for a particular attribute. We can remove attributes. We can um, you know, modify arrays. We can take slices of arrays, order them. Uh, we can add elements, remove elements that match certain conditions and so forth. Um, any questions or doubts about that part? Okay. Um, okay, so we have also some more advanced types of queries. So what we've seen thus far is sort of like querying and updating document at a time sorts of things. So the question is, can you aggregate results over multiple documents? Can you do joins over documents? Uh, you know, what are, what are the other types of operators that you can, you can support in MongoDB? Um, and there is some, um, there are some uh, aggregation, there's an aggregation framework for applying aggregation, aggregations over documents. Uh, a simple one is a sort of an aggregation without grouping. So it'd be like an SQL query without a group by. Uh, one thing we can do, for example, is count the number of distinct uh, values for a particular key or a particular attribute. So this allows us to say, for example, how many different values are there for, uh, for type or how many different values are there for name uh, or year, let's say, um, in the entire collection, the name of the collection here being called. So this is how many, you know, for example, distinct year, how many distinct values are there for year in the documents of this collection. We can also simply just count all the documents in the collection using that count. Um, there's also um, a variety of different uh, aggregation functions. So we can also apply distinct, uh, which is essentially extracting not just the number. Oh, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I've confused myself. Distinct returns an array of unique uh, values for that key, not the number of them. Count returns to the number of documents. So distinct will return, if you say distinct to year, it will return you an array of all of the unique years in the for in the documents of the collection. Um, so here's an example of using distinct, where we're looking for the, an array of the distinct customer IDs, and we get back a, an array with these particular values from the from the collection, a one two three and b two one two. Um, so this example is from the the documentation itself. So we can also define pipelines that transform collections. And essentially the idea is that every stage in this uh, pipeline uh, transforms a collection into another collection. Right? So we can take, uh, we can have a pipeline of stages that, that transform the collections. So in terms of what the different stages can do, there's quite a list of, of different stage operators, things that transform one collection into another. Um, the first is match, which allows us to filter by selection criteria. So it allows us to query and select some subset of the queries of the documents from the input collection. Uh, another is a projection, which will maybe select some of the data within each document of the input collection. We can do grouping, which will allow us to group documents by a given key or value. And this can be then used in combination with some average first, last, max, min, as you have an SQL to be able to uh, find the, the highest rated uh, series for a given year, grouping by year, for example. 
We can do left outer joints, uh, which we'll see an example of soon uh, with another collection. We can copy each document for each value array, which uh, I'll have to explain as well. I'll give uh, an example of that. We can get collection statistics about a collection, uh, which returns another collection that describes it. We can count the documents in a collection. Uh, we can sort the documents by a given key using ascending or descending. We can return up to n first documents. We can return up to n sampled documents, skip n first n documents, and then return the rest as a new collection. We can also save the collection to MongoDB. So certain elements here are not really stage operators. I mean, they're, de they're described as stage operators by the documentation, but out isn't really creating a, a new collection so much as it's just saving a collection. And count uh, is arguably just returning a number rather than a collection. So, uh, but in any case, the other operators are, are uh, transforming one collection into another. In the case of left outer joint or lookup, this is actually taking in two collections and producing uh, producing a new collection. So it's a binary operator. Um, okay, so there's more as well that, that are described in the in the documentation from MongoDB. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples. Um, so this is an example from the documentation where what we're doing is we're applying an aggregate that first matches all of the documents that have status A defined. And then we're going to group these documents by customer ID. And then we're going to take the sum of the amounts per customer. So we take the documents with uh, status A. These are these first three documents here. And this is the result after the match. And then after that, we group according to the customer ID. This is two documents. This customer has one document. We take the sum, which will be 750. And that's defined to be the total in the document. So we have this customer has total 750. This customer has total 200. So this is a, a sort of an example to uh, give an idea of how the aggregate um, function works. Uh, another example that I promised is the left outer join, how this works. So we have two collections. It's a binary operator. Uh, this collection uh, we will say is called series. So we say db.series.aggregate. So we're applying an ag aggregation here. Um, we call the network the lookup aggregation, and we then specify the name of the second collection here, which we assume is called networks. So what we're doing is a left join between this collection here and that collection here. So we have to specify on what attributes we're going to be uh, doing this. So we say local field, which says the name of the attribute here in the, the series uh, collection is country. So we're going to join, do a left join between country and foreign field as nation. So country and nation here, okay, as possible networks. So we're going to return the results of the join, whatever information we can take from here, we're going to store it in the this collection here under the name possible networks. So what this will return as a result of the aggregation is this collection extended with the data from the second collection and uh, named under pot with the attribute possible networks where it shows essentially the documents that match uh, the left join with that and we say that it's a left join because if we have a document here that has no match on the right hand side we don't discard it rather we keep it and um, we provide an empty array for the for the attribute specified in the in the uh, lookup. So again, on this collection, we do a lookup. We specify this, the, the right side of the, of the joint, the second collection. We specify which uh, attribute here we're gonna use. We're gonna specify which attribute here we're gonna use. And we're gonna specify where to uh, store the results in the output, uh, in the output collection. And this is our overall result. Uh, does that make sense? Oh, sorry. Could you please repeat the order of the operations? Um, yeah, so we take this um, this collection here called series, and then we call it aggregate on series. So we need to specify in a join what's the left relation, or in this case, collection. What's the right relation, or in this case, collection. 
So we have this one here is specified here. This one here is specified here. And then we need to say what the join condition is. So what we're saying is country equals uh, nation. Okay. So we want to say country equals nation. And we specify country here. And we specify nation here in the particular peculiar syntax that MongoDB uses. Um, and then we have to say how we're going to store the results of the of the data that we we uh, find on the right hand side that matches. So we take this collection, we find US, we look in the right hand collection for okay, we find the uh, here uh, this document and then we add it into as one of the results in possible networks. Very clear. Thank you. Okay. And so this is effectively a left outer join, um, although MongoDB, I don't think, says as such. But um, the next feature we have that's particular to uh, MongoDB and other kinds of NoSQL systems is uh, the notion of unwind. Um, so the best way to explain this is by an example. We have a document that has a name and four genres in, a, in an array. So if we unwind this collection, what we do is just have three documents uh, where we have each of the genre as a, as a value for genre in the separate documents. Okay, so it's sort of like we unwind the array. So for every element in the array, we create a separate document with genre having that value. Okay. Um, so of course, if we unwind two different arrays, we can easily create, you know, if we unwind multiple arrays, we can quickly create an exponentially large uh, collection. So this could be a, a potentially a complex or expensive feature, although it looks quite quite simple, right? Because uh, we need every combination of values in the two, three, four arrays that we unwind. Um, indexing, I think there's not much time, but uh, yeah, I'll quickly go through this. So we have different types of indexing in MongoDB. We have indexes on IDs, single field indexes that are sorted. So just on year, for example, we have compound indexes that can be defined on multiple uh, columns or multiple attributes, uh, which are sorted. Uh, we can have something called multi-key indexes, which allow for efficient lookups on arrays, for example, to find arrays based on certain values within that array. Geospatial indexing, which uh, we're not gonna sp speak about, but it's good to be aware that there is, and full text indexing for keyword search. We also have the option of hash-based indexing if we prefer um, a hash strategy for, for building our index. And as a text indexing example, something that you'll see in the lab, how to create an index. Okay, so you, you call your collection, create index, you specify the parameters of the index. In this case, it would be uh, what you want to index. So you say you want to index on the, an index on the summary attribute and you want it to be a text index, which means specifically an inverted index on that text. So if you want to see what indexes are available in a collection, you can call get collect get indexes, and you'll see by default, you have indexes on the IDs of documents, but here you'll also see that you have uh, uh, an index on the, um, a full text index on or inverted index on the, on the text uh, field. Okay, so afterwards, if you wanted to, once you've built your inverted index, you can do text searches. So you can say text, I want to uh, search a text. I want to uh, search um, dystopia sci-fi uh, in, in my document. And this will return you all of the matches for dystopia and sci-fi uh, that are available in your, in your document. So we see there's a keyword match here and therefore this result is returned. Uh, very briefly, uh, options for distribution include sharding, where we can do hash-based or horizontal ranged partitioning, which we spoke about in the last class, uh, to split documents over multiple machines. This depends on the indexes. The hash indexes are hash-based. The sorted ones would be horizontal range partitioned. Uh, we can also do replication. As we've seen before, we can have multiple machines indexing copies of the same data um, to ensure that if there's a failure, that, that everything is fine. We can also implement MapReduce-like functions in a sort of JavaScript type syntax, uh, which is a little bit weird, but uh, just to mention that this is possible, I'm not sure I would maybe recommend this, but I've never tried it. Maybe it's good. I, 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 I don't know, but you can specify MapReduce uh, operations within 
um, MongoDB as well. Um, just to briefly end on a word of warning, there's a lot of controversy about MongoDB and lots of people you know, have, have defined various rants and raves about MongoDB and how you should never use MongoDB. And it has a history of security issues data leaks, um, you know, poor, poor guarantees in terms of, you know, uh, you know, no asset guarantees, uh, various problems with security, security reviews, having, making uh, incorrect claims about their security or the results of certain security audits and, and so forth. So they are important to, to keep in mind. In terms of why MongoDB would be popular, I mean, it is very popular. Why it would be so popular under given such issues? Um, one reason is that it's used in this mean stack, uh, which is MongoDB, Express, Angular, Node.js. But you know, it's essentially MongoDB. This is one particular stack for web development. But it's MongoDB was designed from scratch to be a uh, database friendly to particularly web developers who like JavaScript, who like JSON. Um, who like installing something quickly and getting started. It's got very good documentation. It's got a very easy to kind of install and start working with it, uh, which makes it very easy to kind of rapidly develop web applications. Um, so that has made it kind of popular, uh, has increased its popularity um, a lot. But it, there is definitely this these disclaimers are important that you know you should definitely look into these issues it's improving over time but do keep that in mind for for mongodb you know don't maybe store sensitive medical records uh, in a mongodb database for your web application or at least look into the look into the documentation um so that's the uh, <laughs> i'm slightly over sorry uh so that's the class um uh, any questions or doubts? And so I think in general, that, you know, there's we went through a lot of stuff there, uh, it's sort of like a primer for MongoDB. I think the lab will be valuable to kind of digest these things. Uh, so doing seeing this stuff in practice will help a lot. So we'll do that on Wednesday. We'll have a lab on Wednesday with uh, MongoDB where you'll get to play with the system and you can use these slides as reference to, to address the questions of the lab. Um, any questions or doubts? Yeah, sorry, uh, I was late on class. Sure. But uh, I hear you talking about documents when you sp spoke of data. Yep. Does MongoDB work with documents instead of just tuples? Yep. And so the idea of documents would be that you're, it's kind of similar to key values, but Essentially, what document stores allow you to do is to store uh, the value as a document. And the document here, the value can be a text document. It could be a JSON document. It could be an XML document. And different stores will, uh, will support different kinds of documents. It's not that a document store has to support all the different types of documents. But for example, MongoDB is dedicated to JSON. Elasticsearch is also dedicated to JSON, but has more of a focus on text. Uh, there are other systems that will provide other syntaxes. The key difference is that not, not only are you storing the document as a value, but you also permit certain lookups or operations on those documents, like we saw with MongoDB. Uh, so we can index particular fields or particular attributes, for example, to enable an efficient search on them. Um, yeah. So a document store is essentially something where the, the value is some sort of document. It can be text, it can be something semi-structured, X amount of JSON, this sort of idea. Oh, fine. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sorry, I have another question. So when you are storing data, you are actually working with documents that are on your modules, on your folders. Um, not necessarily. Uh, the notion of a document here, it's not like a, a file necessarily. It's more okay. than it's more the notion of like um, you know, how would you you know how would you call this in JSON? You would call this probably a JSON document, even though it's not actually stored as an individual file, you would say it's sort oh, of like okay. a JSON description. Yeah, so it's more that virtual idea of a of a document rather than 
rather than a, you know a, a, a file in a in a file system. Okay. It's like a complete JSON description or a complete JSON uh, XML description or, or whatever you might have, uh, but it's a more virtual notion of a document uh, rather than a, a physical file. Okay. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Oh, or? another question. So another advantage of using MongoDB is that you can work with it more easily for doing a request or that um, kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, so it's very convenient because this, the reason why it became so popular is um, because um, the syntax is very kind of familiar. It was designed for web developers. And there are lots of web developers who, you know, might not have taken a database course, you know, might not have um, seen SQL, might not know about, you know, other types of query languages. And what they see when they come here without knowing anything about selections or projections, there's no such definitions, there's nothing. It's just uh, db.series.insert and a JSON document. So it's like something very familiar to them or something that feels very familiar. The documentation is also written as a quick get started. So it gives you some very simple examples to get started. You can quickly install it and then it gives you some examples. Uh, so you can very quickly get started with using MongoDB. And JSON is a very convenient format that's used in a lot of web development. So you can somehow use your database to directly get back a JSON document that you can use in your in your JavaScript, for example, very easily to, to do what you want. So it's really designed from the, the ground up. Uh, well, I, I can't speak for that. I don't know if that was their objective, but it certainly appears like it was designed from the ground up to appeal to web application developers. Um, and not all of those, web, particularly, you know, not all of those people would have expertise in you know, relational databases and so forth. So uh, even for those with the experience of relational databases, it's just a very convenient rapid development option. It's sort of like you store your data in JSON, you need your data in JSON, you fetch your data in JSON, you're ready to, to use in your uh, web application. And the problem is that, yeah, there has been, you know, certain parts of security and uh, transactional support and so forth have, have been neglected in this in this sort of uh, philosophy of of simplifying you know maybe sometimes it's been oversimplified uh, so that's important to keep in mind thank you yep. so uh, one instance of how this is used in web development is this mean stack uh, which I don't know how popular it is but Heard it, I've heard it spoken about at least. Um, so it's very good with JavaScript, uh, with JSON and so forth. It's, um, yeah. Any other questions for your doubts? Okay, um, so if not, um, we'll see you guys on Wednesday for, um, for a lot. Uh, so we'll play with longer DB. Uh, see, you. Uh, sorry for running over time. Um, so we'll, uh, I'll, I think this is, uh, I won't run over time again. <laughs> I'm running over time more because I'm apologizing, so I'll just stop.